What you're about to see is a documentary on the SAS, the history of the regiment, the history and details of some of its manoeuvres and military dealings, past and present. In this documentary, we'll also get a drive-by. We are in the car and you'll see the current SAS base at Hereford. Um, we go more into the history of the 22, the SAS. And then right at the very end of the video, you'll join me and my nephew as we explore both SAS cemeteries. Firstly, the one at St Martin's, the SAS church in Hereford. And then secondly, the one at Creedon Hill, which is a much more modern military cemetery. So, join us for this one and I hope you're all going to enjoy or find it informative or interesting. Off we go. The Special Air Service, the SAS, is a special forces unit of the British Army. It was founded as a regiment in 1941 by David Sterling and in 1950 it was reconstituted as a corps. The unit specializes in a number of roles including counter-terrorism, hostage rescue, direct action and covert reconnaissance. Much of the information about the SAS is highly classified and the unit is not commented on by either the British government or the Ministry of Defense. Due to the secrecy and sensitivity of its operations, the Corps currently consists of the 22nd Special Air Service Regiment, the regular component, as well as the 21st Special Air Service Regiment, Artists Reserve, and the 23rd Special Air Service Regiment, Reserve, which are reserve units, all under the operational command of United Kingdom Special Forces, UKSF. Its sister unit is the Royal Navy Special Boat Service which specializes in maritime counter-terrorism. Both units are under the operational control of the Director of Special Forces. History of the Regiment The Second World War The Special Air Service was a unit of the British Army during the Second World War that was formed in July 1941 by David Sterling, and originally called L. Detachment. Special Air Service Brigade the L designation and air service name being a tie-in to a British disinformation campaign. Trying to deceive the Axis into thinking there was a paratrooper regiment with numerous units operating in the area, the real SAS would prove to the Axis that the fake one existed. It was conceived as a commando force to operate behind enemy lines in the North African campaign and initially consisted of five officers and 60 other ranks. Its first mission, in November 1941, was a parachute drop in support of the Operation Crusader Offensive, codenamed Operation Squatter. Due to German resistance and adverse weather conditions, the mission was a disaster, 22 men, a third of the unit, were killed or captured. Its second mission was a major success. Transported by the Long Range Desert Group, it attacked three airfields in Libya, destroying 60 aircraft without loss. In September 1942, it was renamed 1st SAS, consisting at that time of four British squadrons, one Free French, one Greek, and the Folboat section. In January 1943, Colonel Sterling was captured in Tunisia and Paddy Main replaced him as commander. In April 1943, the first SAS was reorganized into the Special Raiding Squadron under Maine's command, and the Special Boat Squadron was placed under the command of George Jellicoe. The Special Raiding Squadron fought in Sicily and Italy along with the second SAS, which had been formed in North Africa in 1943 in part by the renaming of the Small Scale Raiding Force. The Special Boat Squadron fought in the Aegean Islands and Dodecanese until the end of the war. In 1944, the SAS Brigade was formed. The unit was formed from 1st Special Air Service 2nd Special Air Service 3rd Special Air Service, 2E Regiment de Chasseurs Parachutists 4th Special Air Service, 3E Regiment de Chasseurs Parachutists. 5th Special Air Service, lineage continued by Belgian Special Forces Group. 
F Squadron, responsible for signals and communications. It was tasked with parachute operations behind the German lines in France and carried out operations supporting the Allied advance through France. Operations Houndsworth, Bol Basket, Loetan and Wallace Hardy Belgium, the Netherlands, Operation Pegasus, and eventually into Germany, Operation Archway. As a result of Hitler's issuing of the commando order on the 18th of October, 1942, the members of the unit faced the additional danger that they would be summarily executed if captured by the Germans. In July 1944, following Operation Bull Basket, 34 captured SAS commandos were summarily executed by the Germans. In October 1944, in the aftermath of Operation Lowertown another 31 captured SAS commandos were summarily executed by the Germans. Post-war At the end of the war, the British government saw no further need for the force, and disbanded it on 8 October, 1945. The following year it was decided there was a need for a long-term deep penetration commando unit and a new SAS regiment was to be raised, as part of the Territorial Army. Ultimately, the artist's rifles, raised in 1860 and headquartered at Dukes Road, Euston, took on the SAS mantle as 21st SAS Regiment V, on the 1st of January, 1947. Malayan Scouts in 1950, a 21st SAS squadron was raised to fight in the Korean War. After three months of training in Britain, it was informed that the squadron would no longer be required in Korea and so it instead volunteered to fight in the Malayan emergency. Upon arrival in Malaya, it came under the command of Mad Mike, Mike Calvert who was forming a new unit called the Malayan Scouts, SAS. Calvert had already formed one squadron from 100 volunteers in the Far East, which became a squadron. The 21 SAS squadron then became B Squadron. And after a recruitment visit to Rhodesia by Calvert, C Squadron was formed from 100 Rhodesian volunteers. The Rhodesians returned home after three years' service and were replaced by a New Zealand squadron. By this time the need for a regular Army SAS regiment had been recognized. The 22 SAS regiment was formally added to the Army list in 1952, and has been based at Hereford since 1960. In 1959 the 3rd Regiment, the 23 SAS regiment, was formed by renaming the Reserve Reconnaissance Unit, which had succeeded MI9 and whose members were experts in escape and evasion. The SAS base, Sterling Lines. We'll firstly, discuss a little of its history. Then, you'll join me and Brandon, as we get some exterior shots, of the base, from the relative safety of the car. Sterling Lines is a British Army garrison in Credenhill, Herefordshire. The headquarters of the 22 Special Air Service Regiment, 22nd SAS and the Special Reconnaissance Regiment, the SRR. The site was formerly a Royal Air Force RAF non-flying station for training schools, known as RAF Creedenhill. In 1958, the Special Air Service SAS was temporarily based at Meerbrook Camp in Mulvern, Worcestershire, a former emergency military hospital that had remained largely unused since 1945. In 1960, the SAS moved to a former Royal Artillery Boys Training Unit, Bradbury Lines in Hereford, which was renamed in 1984 to Sterling Lines in honor of the regiment's founder, Lieutenant Colonel David Sterling. In 1994, the RAF ceased using RAF Creedenhill, the Army then obtaining the site to redevelop as a new base for the SAS, works commenced in 1997. The SAS commenced relocation of staff and equipment to Creedenhill from Hereford with the redevelopment of the site. The move was completed in May 1999. On the 30th of September, 2000, the official opening ceremony was held for the new Sterling Lines with the clock tower re-erected on the new parade ground. The Hereford site was sold to a property developer in March 2001 and is now the housing estate, which, we'll discover, in our drive-by. 
So, join us from the car as we get some exterior views of the base. Then, after that, we'll learn a little more about the 22nd Special Air Service Regiment in more recent times. As the 22nd are the main ones that'll feature in this video. When we visit both military cemeteries and pay our respects at the graves of these fallen heroes. Now, ladies and gents, join us for those exterior views of the base. Morning ladies and gents, and we're at our first location for the day. SAS base at Hereford. As you can see, it is pretty well guarded and secured. The main entrance is even more secure than this called one. Sterling so, Lines. It's called Sterling Lines SAS base. So, that's a little first glimpse of that. Some more views of it possibly, or going into the history and other things like that. So, join us for that part of the video next. And here we are at the other side of the base. You can see it over there. Where they do all their training and manoeuvres and lots of stuff around here. As my nephew said to me, this started off as an RAF base first and then later turned into an SAS base, but more of that in the history as we go on. So yeah, go on, let me off. I'll still keep filming, it gives a long view then. And at that bit over there, they should be first round. Very secure, isn't it? Alright, so join us for the next part, ladies and gents. Just having a drive by now, ladies and gents, of the part of the base. As you can see, it skirts the housing estate. The 22nd SAS Regiment and some of its activity in more recent times. The event that the SAS are most famous for in our own era is the Iranian Embassy Siege. The Iranian Embassy Siege took place from the 30th of April to the 5th of May 1980 after a group of six armed men stormed the Iranian Embassy on Prince's Gate in South Kensington, London. The gunmen, Iranian Arabs, campaigning for sovereignty of Khuzestan province took 26 people hostage including embassy staff, several visitors, and a police officer who had been guarding the embassy. They demanded the release of prisoners in Khuzestan and their own safe passage out of the United Kingdom. The British government quickly decided that safe passage would not be granted, and a siege ensued. Subsequently, police negotiators secured the release of five hostages in exchange for minor concessions such as the broadcasting of the hostage-taker's demands on British television. By the sixth day of the siege, the gunmen were increasingly frustrated at the lack of progress in meeting their demands. That evening, they killed a hostage and threw his body out of the embassy. The Special Air Service SAS initiated Operation Nimrod to rescue the remaining hostages, abseiling from the roof and forcing entry through the windows. During the 17-minute raid they rescued all but one of the remaining hostages and killed five of the six hostage-takers. An inquest cleared the SAS of any wrongdoing. The sole remaining gunman served 27 years in British prisons. The operation brought the SAS to the public eye for the first time and bolstered the reputation of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's government. The SAS was quickly overwhelmed by the number of applications it received from people inspired by the operation, and experienced greater demand for its expertise from foreign governments. The building was severely damaged by fire during the assault and was not reopened until 1993. The SAS raid, televised live on a bank holiday evening, became a defining moment in British history and proved a career boost for several journalists. It became the subject of multiple documentaries and works of fiction, including several films and television series. Now, the next major event of the 1980s involving Special Air Service SAS. The Falklands Conflict. When Argentina invaded the Falklands in April 1982, 
Britain dispatched a large naval task force to recapture the Falklands. Steaming south with the British fleet were D and G squadron of the SAS, with supporting signals units. Accompanying the two squadrons was Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rose, the commander of 22 SAS, who would be the man who'd accept Argentina's surrender of the Falklands. What the SAS did, in the case of the Falkland Islands War, was inserting small reconnaissance teams onto the still-occupied islands ahead of regular British soldiers. Primarily using Sea King helicopters to fly in and out under cover of darkness, and as low as possible, to evade Argentine radar. SAS patrols on the Falklands would later call in highly effective airstrikes by Harrier jets. There was even a daring and ultimately abortive attempt to infiltrate the Argentine mainland and destroy the feared Super Etendard attack jets with their Exocet anti ship missiles. As said, it was Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rose, the commander of 22 SAS, who accepted Argentina's surrender. On the 14th of June, 1982, Argentine ground forces surrendered, signaling the end of the Falklands War and the islands returned back to British possession. SAS activities of more recent years. For the last 30 years, the SAS had been deployed around the world in a series of small conflicts, honing its skills in counterinsurgency and counterterrorism. For the first time since World War II, the regiment was about to take part in a large-scale conflict. The SAS were integrated into JSOC and focused its counterinsurgency efforts on combating Al-Qaeda in Iraq and the Sunni insurgency alongside Delta Force. The counterinsurgency was successful, and the UKSF mission in Iraq ended in May 2009. Overall, more than 3,500 terrorists were taken off the streets of Baghdad by the 22nd SAS Regiment. Various British newspapers have speculated on SAS involvement in Operation Elemy and the 2011 Libyan Civil War. The Daily Telegraph reports that defense sources have confirmed that the SAS has been in Libya for several weeks and played a key role in coordinating the fall of Tripoli. While The Guardian reports, they have been acting as forward air controllers, directing pilots to targets and communicating with NATO operational commanders. They have also been advising rebels on tactics. Members of the Special Air Service were deployed to northern Iraq in late August 2014, and according to former MI6 Chief Richard Barrett, would also be sent to Syria. Tasked with trying to track down the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant ISIL terrorist group that the press labeled the Beatles. In recent years, SAS officers have risen to senior appointments in the British Army and Armed Forces. General Peter de la Billière was the commander-in-chief of the British forces in the 1990 Gulf War. General Michael Rose became commander of the United Nations Protection Force in Bosnia in 1994. In 1997 General Charles Guthrie became chief of the defense staff, the head of the British Armed Forces. Lieutenant General Cedric Delves was appointed commander of the field army and deputy commander-in-chief. NATO Regional Headquarters, Allied Forces North, in 2002-2003. Now that we've discussed the history, and much more, about the regiment, it's now time, to pay our respects, to those who've made the ultimate sacrifice. So, please join us. Firstly at the Commonwealth War Grave section, in the churchyard of the SAS Church, St. Martin's Hereford. Then lastly, in the much newer, Creedon Hill Military Cemetery. Being more recent than I'd usually cover, we didn't linger too long, at each grave. So, please pause to read any of the inscriptions. Plus there will be photos of each stone, on the page soon. So you can read them, more easily that way, if you prefer. Hello ladies and gents, and uh, we've fi I've finished in the church now. 
we're in the churchyard. Um, these are the SAS men's graves. Now they are more recent than I normally would film. So what I'm going to say here is if anyone whose family is buried here, you see this video and you're not comfortable with it being online, please message me immediately and the video will be taken down right away. And that I promise you. I don't like to cover things that are too recent, but these men are so brave and so important in our country's history and in our own recent history, the 1970s, in many of our lifetimes, these ones and the ones that behind us are more recent. And these men will one day become history as we think of it. Like we think we think of the First World War and the Second World War as history. Pause for each one. I don't want to focus too, too long on them, but I do want to cover them because it's such an important part of the national history, really. And I've seen this one online a couple of times. So, Commonwealth War Graves, you're generally okay covered for that. As I was saying to my nephew, it's the private family graves that you need to get permission for. I've only had a, ever had a permission filming for one modern grave once and that was from the, the young man's mum, Thomas Corley Cox. Commonwealth War Graves Commission always looks after their graves. They always look after their own. I'm sorry that some of the inscriptions are a little bit obscured by plants and stuff, but I'm not going to be going fiddling around with anything like that here because this is ultimate respect to territory and being on my best behaviour. See, my nephew is not comfortable with the filming in cemeteries. He's he worries that people won't like it, but I did say to him, mate, these videos <laughs> are quite popular. Be surprised the amount of people that find it informative. It's, it feels wrong to say enjoy it, but find them informative. And they are a part of the history. And when Brandon's old, his children, grandchildren if he has any, look, Falkland Islands, his children and grandchildren if he has any, these men, to them, they will then be history, as we think of our grandparents at the First and Second World War, or grandparents and great-grandparents. Memorial Garden. And I won't cover, obviously, the uh, the ones that are not Commonwealth War Graves. There's a few more up here. Brave men. And the thing is, with the secrecy that shrouds the SAS, Many of the missions that they dealt in, even now, some of the Second World War stuff is still not public sector. So, I think it's nice that they've got their own area that these men are all buried together band of brothers and that Let me 
got this one over here, which is just a memorial stone and a bench. And then you've got all these that run along there, which I'm not really going to cover that much because they're not Commonwealth War Graves and where you stand on that one, I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, um, I'll pause it just in case we find any older ones or anything like that. These ones here that are pointed all along the wall, they're the, uh, the Falkland Islands, 5th of April 1982 to the 14th of June 1982. We the pil Pilgrim's Master, we shall go always a little further. It may be beyond that last blue mountain, barred with snow, across Angry or that glimmering sea. So yeah, we'll just have a slow and respectful walk by. Because as I say, they are an important part of our country's history, aren't they, these men? Many of these I've uh, read about and seen things on online. He's on the wall. He's on the wall? Yeah. Might be over this side then. Because these are all Falk... These are all Falkland Islands. It could be on the opposite... There's plaques on the opposite side of this wall. It's a particular... Uh, particular young man, my nephew's trying to find. And these are really recent, these ones, so I'll not cover those. But yeah, this is the Falkland Islands and Commonwealth War Graves. And the lovely old church, the SAS church. Hope you've all found this one interesting, ladies and gents. If I find any more interesting ones, I'll, I'll pause and then we'll see. And this is the one my nephew was looking for, Corporal S.J. Lane, Military Medal, uh, 30 for the 7th, 1963, to 26 of the 1st, 91, at the Bravo 20, and he was with Andy McNabb, and going to show us the other one now, so... I'll walk you up to that because it's right at the end. See, he knows a lot about the uh, military history. Uh, interesting, this, isn't it? It's sad, but it's it's interesting. I'm really, really glad you uh, we came here. Like you bought a seed today. It's fascinating. That That's the other member. Look, Vincent David Phillips. Bravo 20, Special Air Service, 26th of January 1991, aged 36. Uh, so yeah, that's two, just two among the many, many important and interesting people, because they're all important, especially the SAS. And you get a military headstone like this, and... I haven't seen any, I don't know you. What's that? I haven't seen many. Oh, my nephew was just saying he's not seen many of these military headstones before. Um, if you go in cemeteries and have a walk around them, mate, you'll see them dotted around sometimes. Lovely. There's 16 in ours. You know East London the Cemetery? SAS, no, not SAS. No, not that I've ever found, but they may be some somewhere. Uh, there's bound to be a database of SAS graves the, um, somewhere. Next location? Yep. Well, ladies and gents, I hope you all found this interesting. Um, like my nephew just pointed out this one, look. Julian Anthony Ball, member of the British Empire and Military Cross. Just some of the orders and awards that these men have got. And I'll get you to the memorial stone at the end and that's what we shall end on. So massive thanks to my nephew for making this day possible because it's been an interesting one hasn't it I get a view of the church I want to get to get a view of the back of that just like that picture and then I shall end you off with this 22nd Special Air Service Regiment God rest their souls indeed so thank you for watching everyone I hope you've all found this interesting and informative and rest in peace Afternoon ladies and gents and we're in Creedon Hill Military Cemetery 
in Hereford. Uh, this is a, a much newer one, but because of the, the SAS theme and we're being in the area, I did want to cover it because it is important. There aren't a lot of graves at the moment, thank goodness, but there is space for a lot more, unfortunately. Pause to read each one if you want to. Special Air Reconnaissance Regiment. This one here, John S. Hollingsworth, CGC, is Conspicuous Gallantry Medal. So, you can look each one of these men up because they, not all of them died in active service kind of thing. So if you want to look them up, you can. Then our most recent two are just over here. <clears throat> you see along there are the spaces for new headstones and the graves of other men. You may either fall in battle or be allotted a place here having served in the SAS. And there is more of it through that way, which we'll walk around that way in a sec. So I shall pause you and then you'll pick me back up here. All right. All right off we go, ladies and gents. As I say, this is very recent, of course, but an important part of history, or it will become so anyway. Just sad to think. Uh, you go in a cemetery and you, you don't... Mm, you don't normally see it laid out and ready. It's, it's a bit of an unnerving sight, that one, I'm afraid. Oh, look, there are things on these stands. No, they're just insignias from yeah. the regiments in the SAS. Oh, I'll have a look at them then. So you've got the SAS, SBS, yeah. um, SRR, and the intelligence board. And it's got a proper lich gate as well. There's the insignias there. A proper old fashioned looking lich gate too. Lich gates were originally created for when coffins came to be buried in a churchyard. That's where the vicar would stand and receive the coffin. The lich gate. Some kinds, sometimes called dead gates or death gates. Uh, Creedon Hill Military Cemetery. Pilgrim's Gate, this is called. As for the Pilgrim reference from the one of the mottos of the SAS. 
you've got two statues one here I don't know what my nephew's looking at there but this is we saw um, the cross of sacrifice didn't we on the Imperial War Museum when we went there that's that and the other is over here in memory of those killed on operations since the 1st of January 1964 Where are the men's names? I am taking photos as well so You'll be able to look back at those if you didn't pick them all up. What was that, mate, over there? That board. Oh, it's just nothing on there. Yeah, and that's it, ladies and gents. That's the Creedon Hill Military Cemetery. Fairly new one. You've been watching a documentary by London Luke and Brandon. I hope you all found it interesting or informative. If you did enjoy this one, you may want to watch the SAS Church, which will be hitting the page later on today. And that's the Church of St. Martin's Hereford, with its strong SAS links and the churchyard, which contains so many of the Commonwealth war graves. So thank you very much for watching. If you did find it interesting or informative, please give it a like and a share. Thank you.